Okay, I had a sub sur survivor subscriber request. Um, <clears throat> they wanted me to kind of just go into some basics of physics and to try to kind of explain some things. I've done some previous problems, and they wanted me to just kind of go in and uh, break some things down. So uh, I just want to talk a little bit about what is physics, why we study it. Um, you know, a lot of people they think about physics and they think, man, this is just it's just a bunch of complicated sets of rules and confusing laws and things of that nature but um it's really not that bad um it's about finding the simplest and least complicated explanation for things you know when we were looking at things and figure things out there's like three different aspects of physics um one is describing organization understanding natural law and um kind of deducing from what we see and applying the natural law. So, um, just to jump back in, in the universe, um, in the universe, everything is pretty much matter and energy. Um, everything is made up of either, you know, matter or energy. Um, and so we can break everything down in the universe to those two things. Even like your hands or like some goop you picked up or dug your hand into. It's all matter. And the matter is all the stuff of the universe that has mass. Okay. Your matter. You're walking to these, all these people, they are composed of matter. This rock is composed of matter. Uh, even the um, air we breathe. Okay, so that is matter. Matter has mass. The second uh, aspect is energy. Alright. Energy is kind of like the force that um, it's a it's like the measure of the ability to make things change so matter is kind of like the physical part of things or the stuff that makes up the universe and energy is a measure of the ability to make things change energy kind of flows um, anytime something gets hotter colder speeds up or slows down all right so these are just very um, important aspects and energy also is transferred when we can see a physical notable noticeable change like we look at the butterfly and the pupil, larva pupil stage and everything like that so heat cold speeding up slowing down noticeable change that is what um, that's how energy we can we can tell that there's a change in energy. Natural law. Natural law is kind of like a rule that tells us how or why something happens in a particular and the particular way it does. Um, all events obey natural nature, and they obey natural laws. And these laws they don't change. Um, let's talk about a ball rolling down the hill. Um, Basically, one natural law tells you that a ball rolling down a hill at a certain height will have a certain speed at the bottom. If we put the ball back up top and let it go and let it roll down the ramp again, it's going to have that same speed again. So physics is kind of just concerned with understanding natural laws and how they relate to matter and energy. Now the third part, and th third part of physics is kind of figuring out natural laws. Okay, um, natural laws are like human explanations based on human experience. Okay, just like our ball in the ramp. Um, part of the slide, just like that ball in that ramp. Um, physics helps us helps us find out the how and the why. So, there's a couple th ways that we figure out the how and the why. We figure it out through experiments and analysis. Experiment. Experiment is a situation where we carefully set up things to see what happens and under what type of controlled conditions. Analysis is the detailed thinking you do to interpret, kind of like the data you see. So the data you see is what you kind of observe. You know, this man, he's looking at the data, and he's like, okay, well, 
you know, the ball was this speed, it was at zero meters per second velocity, but by the time it got down to the bottom, it was, I don't know, say 100 miles per hour. Or, uh, roughly, I don't know, what is it, 44 meters per second, somewhere around there. So we use, exper we use experiment and analysis to kind of help us draw conclusions. Um, and we can develop natural laws and kind of understand natural law better. So back to our universe. Everything is composed of matter and energy. So how do we kind of, we, uh, how do we, um, I guess, what am I trying to say? How do we, you know, figure out what matter is and what energy is? Well, matter is something we can see, like I told you, you know, it's physical. Energy is not always physical. So here's mass. We look at the big sumo wrestler <coughs> and the little guy there, the sumo wrestler in tra training. We can see that the larger man has more mass than the little boy in training. Okay, so... Um, matter when we talk about states of matter liquid, solid, gas these are this is a big sumo wrestler and a smaller sum, sumo wrestler they're both composed of matter matter is defined as anything that takes up space it's the measure of the amount of matter that makes up an object alright let's take this airplane for instance this airplane or Let's look at the aircraft carrier first. The aircraft carrier has more mass than the airplane. And we can go back and forth and we can see that the aircraft carrier is much bigger than the actual airplane. It has more mass. But why does the aircraft carrier have more mass? It has more mass because it contains more steel, plastic, and rubber than the actual airplane. So when we look at this, the aircraft carrier has more mass than the airplane because it's kind of composed of more. It takes more things or uh, components that take up space. More steel, rubber, plastics, whatever it takes. Um, I don't really need to go into what it takes to build an aircraft carrier, but we know that it takes more materials more cost to build this aircraft carrier than it does the actual airplane. All right. So, what about air? Does air matter? Does air take up space? I thought this was funny because the man is taking up more space. This man has more mass than the passenger sitting next to him. But back to air. Does air take up space? If we look at this glass. This glass is full of air. All right. And it is taking up space. Even when you breathe, you can feel your lungs expand and contract. But let's look at a cylinder. And let's look at when we have high pressure, low volume, and low pressure, and high volume. Alright. When we put this, these air, when we put this pocket of air in a smaller space, it has higher pressure and has low volume. When we pull the piston back, it has a lot of volume, which, which means it takes up more space, but it has a lower pressure. You can feel this when you inhale and exhale. Your diaphragm, in inhalation, your diaphragm moves down and your lungs expand. When you breathe out, you exhale, your diaphragm moves up. And your diaphragm is just the muscle that controls your breathing. Alright, so air does take up space. Not as much as this guy, but it does. What about light? Does light take up space? Could we call it light matter? Mm, if we take this glass, light is definitely in this glass. Because if we were in the dark, you wouldn't see the glass. Um, so, light, we wouldn't necessarily uh, consider having mass or matter. So... Let's talk about energy for a second, and that will lead us into our question. I always kind of throw in a question. Imagine dropping stones. There's stones falling out of this person's hand. All right. We know that the stone has mass because it takes up space, and it's a certain height off the ground. If we use physics to investigate, we would learn that 
we couldn't get a whole lot of speed by dropping these stones. Let's just say the woman is, I don't know, five foot three or something like that. And these stones are falling. They will fall and gravitation will pull pull on those pull on these stones or pull the stones down to the ground at nine point eight meters per second squared. But could they reach a hundred miles per hour? Probably not. Because there's not enough distance um, and the energy from gravitational pull would not be able to act on these stones to get it up to a speed because there's not enough distance so distance definitely plays a part in energy all right so being that the woman is five foot three or so above and her hands are outreached and you know be a, and the stones will fall at a lower height than five foot three if the top of her head is five foot three but these stones would not reach a speed of 100 miles per hour. Okay, so this leads into our question. Let's assume that an object close to the surface of the earth, like a cliff or a tall building, something like that, how much distance would the object need to be dropped from? So what distance? How much distance would the object need to be dropped from in order to achieve a speed of 100 miles an hour? So like the lady, in the hand, with stone, with, like the lady with stones falling from her hand, um, you know, would that be a sufficient enough height for these stones to reach 100 miles an hour? Probably not. Most definitely not. So what do we know? We know that gravity acts on an object at 9.8 meters per second squared. So, what does that mean? In layman's terms, initially the speed of the object would be zero. After one second, the velocity of an object will be 4.9 meters per second. After three seconds, 14.7 meters per second. So we know this because we can uh, use, because that looks like it's spelled properly. I don't know why there's red lines on there, but I'll just leave it like that. We can use a part of, the, of a formula that I cited in a previous video. The part I'll use is one half gravitational pull times times squared doesn't want to go away there we go it went away all right so one half gravitational pull times 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 squared all right so I'll identify one half we'll use 0.5 gravitational pull is 9.8 and it looks like this thing got into all the slides and we'll go ahead and we'll adjust So one half, gravitational pull 9.8 meters per second squared. And let's get all these extra T's out of here. Alright, all right, 9.8 meters per second squared times time. Alright, times time squared. So if we use that, we can find the distance that an object travels over time. And we can use this to kind of solve our the uh, to get the answer to our question. Alright, so let's just say at 4.9 at one second, like I said previously, uh, if, we let this, if we let a ball or stone or any object go from the top of this cliff after one second, uh, it will travel a distance of 4.9 meters. So we can take that using the table, and we've, inter we've inserted that into the table. Here we have time, and we have the distance an object falls. After two seconds, 19.6 meters. We just plug the numbers in, 0.5 times 9.8. And be careful because first we need to square the second, so this becomes a four times 9.8 times 0.5. We get 19.6 meters of distance falling. In three seconds, we square the three. Three times three is nine times 9.8 times 0.5, and that will give us 44.1 meters. And I've even installed 5 seconds, and we have 122.5. Also, again, remember, 5 seconds, we square that 25 times 9.8 times 5, 0.5, sorry. And that's how we come up to figure out that the distance that the object falls is 122.5 meters. Alright, so now, first thing we need to do is translate. We're dealing with meters per second, but now we need to know or figure out. Uh, 
what is 100 miles per hour in meters per second and it is 44.704 meters per second now what we do is we can go back to this table and how we find our distance falling we can divide the distance by time so we figured out that when we plug this in here in time um, one second times 9.8 and then uh, divided by, uh, multiplied by 0.5, we came up with 4.9 meters. That's how we get our distance. One second, plugged into here, squared, and then multiplied by 9.8 and 0.5, we get 4.9. If we plugged in two seconds, two squared is four, times 9.8 times 0.5, and so on and so forth. So the only thing that changes in each instance is we take the second, plug it in here, and square it. Two seconds plug it in here square it we do that for each section and then we multiply by 9.8 times 0.5 so now we know this now so now we need to know um, well, we can take our distance or um, I'm sorry we can take our speed which is 44, which is 100 miles, which is 44.704 meters per second. And we can multiply that by 2 and then divide by 9.8. So don't let this bottom part fool you because this is a part of the table that we made. So since we know 100 miles an hour is 44.704 meters per second, we can take the meters per second here, multiply by 2 seconds, and then divide by 9.8 meters per second. And that's all we're doing. And we come up with an elapsed time in 9.1232 seconds of time this object will be at 100 miles per hour or 44.704 meters per second um, so we plugged in our time we square it like we did previously when we got the one two three four five seconds we take our 9.1232 seconds square it, we come up with a number, and then we multiply that by 9.8, and then we multiply by 0.5. So our answer is 407.84 meters, or 1,333 feet. All right, so that was our subscriber's request, one of our subscriber's requests. There probably was like a test question in physics or something like that, and so that's okay. I don't mind solving them. And I encourage you guys to send me more questions. You can send them to my Gmail account at K-I-E-N-O-T-H-O-M-A-S at gmail.com. And um, I hope you guys like this video. Please like, subscribe, hit the subscribe button below, and share on your social media networks. I thank you guys for watching. Have a great evening.